Thank you very much. And uh, I think this was a very interesting demonstration on the use of uh, OCT. And I totally agree with you, as uh, you will see. I will try to give a little bit more of an overview on the use of uh, uh, OCT, what it can provide to us. So I will give you a little bit more insight uh, uh, how much uh, it can be seen and uh, it can be observed by uh, using this technology. We just have, I would say, wonderful demonstration of two good examples on how it can, uh, it can be used. These are my general disclosures. Uh, let's go back a little bit and uh, when we talk about revascularization, one of the classical studies uh, we have and probably one of uh, the most relevant studies that provided actually a lot of evidence for the guidelines is the syntax trial. And uh, uh, I will not go into details, but two important uh, um, conclusions from this trial, these are not the conclusions from the trial, so if I can have the slide, <laughs> is uh, uh, the two main complications, so the uh, myocardial infarction and repeat revascularization, which are two of uh, the clinical conditions that uh, we really want to prevent or to reduce as much as possible, although we know that uh, this will happen in a certain percentage of patients. And uh, uh, the main question here is how can we use some of the new technology and particularly the imaging technology, considering we have now new generation regulating stands, we just saw beautiful examples also of uh, BVS, how can we avoid unnecessary stent implantation? And here the use of uh, functional uh, assessment with FFR and IFR have uh, helped us to select better the patients. Then how to avoid under-treatment of hemodynamically significant lesions also by hemodynamic assessment of these lesions. And what is the topic of this uh, uh, discussion now? How can we optimize stent implantation so we can reduce the number of patients that will do repeat revascularization and reduce the number of patients who will develop either stent thrombosis or acute coronary syndromes. If we look at the, uh, the guidelines uh, on the indication for revascularization, we can do this for prognostic uh, terms or to relieve symptoms and there are uh, many, uh, in many cases, based on the syntax evidence, the indications on how and when to do this revascularization. But what is important here is the clinical value of using some intracoronary diagnostic techniques to improve the way we can actually do this revascularization by PCI. And here, FFR is now considered as a 1A indication, but we will not talk about that now. The other important aspect is the use of uh, intracoronary imaging. Uh, IVOS now is considered as a 2A indication to assess the severity and optimize the treatment of unprotected left main, and also to assess the mechanisms of stent failure, where OCT now is included as a 2A, which means it should be used when there is uh, an evidence of uh, or suspicion of stent failure, as we just saw in the examples that uh, were previously shown. And then it's considered as a 2B, which means that it, it may be used in selected patients to optimize stent implantation. And for the moment, these are the indications in the guidelines. And you can see that the level of evidence is C, which means that it's, uh, it results from the consensus among the experts, not a lot of evidence of data uh, to uh, support these recommendations. But let me give you a couple of examples on how uh, the use of uh, uh, OCT can actually be helpful. This is in the setting of uh, an acute coronary syndrome. And uh, in this case, we have a patient uh, who presents uh, with a STEMI. And in this case, what happened was that uh, the patient had a clinical presentation, but when OCT was done, instead of having a ruptured uh, fibrous cap, there was actually an eroded fibrous cap. And uh, uh, what is the consideration now is that probably in these cases, we don't even need to stent. If there is no evidence of uh, rupture, and if there is no obstructive lesion after you do the aspiration of the uh, thrombi, which again is something that uh, we can discuss, and uh, if there is only erosion demonstrated by OCT, maybe these patients uh, will do well only with dual antiplatelet uh, therapy and antithrombotic treatment. And this is actually what is the basis of uh, uh, this study. And uh, what they did here, they used also CT angio, and uh, they divided the patient in two groups. 
So one group, they uh, underwent just dual antiplatelet treatment. It's a small group of uh, patients that are actually ongoing trials trying to look at uh, this problem. And basically what they've demonstrated was that after a medium follow-up of about two years, target lesion revascularization was performed only in one patient in group two, which was the group that was treated only with antiplatelet treatment. Again, these are patients that by OCT, they do show only erosion of the plaque, no rupture, and no limiting lesion, flow limiting lesion. And in this case, no myocardial infarction, heart failure, or deaths occurred uh, in either group. And again, this opens the way for a potential change in paradigm in the treatment of acute coronary syndromes in this specific subset of, uh, of patients. But let me give you a little bit more now on the use of uh, OCT and how does it compare with some other imaging uh, modalities. Well, as we know, the imaging source and the, the, uh, the, the, physical, uh, the physics that is behind OCT is near infrared light, so it's light with ultrasound is uh, ultrasound. And one of the main differences, which is actually one of the main reasons why OCT can provide such important information is about resolution. So the resolution of OCT is about 10 to 15 microns, which compared with ultrasound, which even with 40 megahertz uh, transducers, the best we can get is about 150, maybe a little bit less if you go up to 40 or 50 megahertz, and uh, which means that it's about one-tenth the resolution of uh, uh, better of the OCT when compared with, uh, uh, with intravascular ultrasound. Uh, angioscopy is not so much used uh, nowadays. There is now some uh, uh, new um, uh, infrared light and near field, uh, 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 this new technique, which uh, is still a research technique that can provide also uh, important uh, information. But today we'll be talking about the use of uh, LCT. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about how much we can get with the, this technique we can basically get like slices, like doing in vivo histology of the coronary arteries. So it's really fantastic. And the, the ones familiar with this technique, it's really amazing the amount of information that we can get. And we basically doing slices of the coronary arteries in vivo, like tomographic slices, but with very high resolution. It's like looking at histology in vivo. This is the normal appearance of the vessel wall of a coronary artery with the three layers. Uh, this was actually reviewed on the uh, do expert uh, document that I was part of. There were a couple of uh, papers that were published uh, a couple of years ago, which summarized a lot of uh, not only the technical part, but also some of uh, uh, the indications uh, that uh, currently exist for the use of this uh, uh, methodology. So to summarize how much it can help us for pre-PCI, and I will show you then some examples, it can help in the lesion assessment to look at the extent of the disease, for instance, uh, to look at plaque morphology, to look at the identification of thrombos and assessment of aspiration, like the case I showed you of a patient in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, and also to guarantee that there is a full coverage of lesions uh, in PCI, which may be important uh, uh, in drug eluting stents, and now with, uh, with BVS, it could also uh, see, uh, be an uh, interesting uh, group of uh, lesions to, to look at. This shows a, a nice example of how you can uh, uh, separate diffuse from uh, And again, when you compare with the uh, histology, with pathology, you can uh, nicely demonstrate the different types of plaque composition from diffusely fibrotic to a lipid pool to ca a calcific component and thrombi, which can be nicely shown also on these different images, the, three, the most common uh, type of plaques, fibrotic, calcified, or lipid, which by this technique, because of the very high resolution, can be demonstrated. This is a nice example of a, a lipid pool, and here you have actually a very nice example of a plaque rupture, which can be demonstrated by uh, this uh, technology, again, because of the very high resolution of the method. This is an example on the right coronary of uh, right coronary artery of a lipid uh, uh, pool here with a very thin fibrous cap, and then you can also demonstrate the presence of uh, thrombos. It can show plaque hemorrhage, 
uh, which uh, is, uh, and these are animal studies, where you can see nicely here the correlation with pathology. And here you can actually see a cluster of thumb cells, which are located in, in the fibrous cap, and there is a band with very high uh, reflectivity. It can demonstrate new uh, vascularization uh, in the adventitia, which you can nicely see here, and also demonstrate the type of lesion that you can observe, like in this example of a diffuse stable lesion in the right coronary artery, where you can do basically the whole tracking of the lesion along, uh, uh, along the vessel. It can show also uh, and demonstrate culpit non-significant lesion. Here you can see nicely an example of a dissection of a thrombos and of a lipid tool in the same vessel. Or it can show loose versus dense fibrotic tissue. And again, because of the very high resolution, this is what the kind of images that can be provided by this method. Now, post-PCI, and uh, we've seen the examples, the uh, main uh, aspects where uh, OCT can help to optimize PCI, on one hand, on the identification of dissections and intimal tears, to assess the result of road ablation, for instance, uh, when there is heavy calcification of uh, 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 PCI, and uh, also when you have to do post dilatation and you have some questioning, to assess stent expansion or underexpansion, as we've seen, as assess uh, stent strut apposition or malapposition, which may be very relevant in some examples, and we've seen already some today, stent strut uh, distribution at side branches and bifurcations, and then the visualization of absorption and remodeling in the new era of the bioreservable uh, strands. Let me just give you a few examples. This is uh, to look at uh, strut apposition, and uh, this is uh, very important uh, uh, because it shows if there is a, a good, perfect apposition of the struts, and it can, they can be seen, look at here, they can be seen very nicely, and uh, uh, you see this uh, brightness inner surface reflection and the shadowing behind, and you can exactly locate both from uh, bare metal stands and for drug looting stands, the exact location and how well uh, opposed they are uh, on the coronary uh, vessel. You can, and here it shows nicely the distribution on one hand of the struts and then the shadowing behind the struts and its exact location regarding uh, uh, the intima. This is an example of a malapposition and you can detect this very nicely, as you can see here, look at the distance between the strut and the vessel, so there is a clear gap here, which shows very, it's very easy to see this level of uh, uh, malaposition, as we saw in the, in the previous example. Here we can see the result of, uh, after some time, of uh, covered struts, and again, it was, it's very nice to demonstrate how uh, the, the, uh, the covering of these struts is, is being done. And this was actually the technique that made it possible to see the natural history of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this covering of, uh, of the struts. And then the examples where you have uncovered struts, as you can see nicely here, you see the covered struts here and uncovered here. And, th and then also to demonstrate the presence of uh, stent thrombosis, as is the example that you have here, which is very nice examples on uh, uh, stent uh, thrombosis. So I would say that uh, currently the use of LCT can be very useful. I totally agree with the, uh, the previous colleague. It's not a, a widespread technique to use. We don't use it in uh, every single patient, of course, but it can be useful in certain instances for diagnostic applications to improve plaque characterization to evaluate, in some cases, uh, pre-intervention, to guide during the intervention, and particularly to monitor some of these procedures where we do have some questions, and particularly when we suspect that th there was a problem uh, with, the, uh, with the procedure itself. And it may be also useful in the assessment of uh, outcome following intervention. There are some ongoing studies, uh, uh, and actually there's already a little bit of data in this regard, and I think that also one 